Um, I'm so, so grateful that Blair Bernson was able to um, step up at a moment's notice to be with us tonight. And um, we literally contacted him last night when Dennis's, um, when Dennis's internet went down. So I guess everyone's having some trouble with computers these days. But Blair is with us tonight. Um, what can I say about Blair? Well, one, one thing is um, when I took on the position of uh, chair for meetings, I was stepping into Blair's shoes. And those are some pretty big shoes to fill. Um, Blair has, I always thought of him as um, so confident in front of a group, well-spoken. He always had fantastic speakers, um, just completely at ease with the audience. And um, when I stepped up to do this job, I was really shy and afraid to do it. And I always compared myself to Blair. So here I am in this position, introducing Blair, and he says to me, but Cindy, I can't fill Dennis's shoes. Maybe I could fill his sandals. So I just wanna say, Blair, um, you left a set of big shoes for me to fill and I'm doing my best. And I'm so thrilled that you're here tonight to talk about your, um, your project with birding, with connecting with people, which with reaching across divides. I'm so excited. It's a really great time to have you um, give this presentation and thank you for being here and working with some of the technical difficulties that we're coping with tonight. So let's see if your mic works and everyone give um, Blair a silent uh, bit of applause. Thank you, Blair. So am I on now? Is this time to be on stage? You're on. I'm on. Okay. Well, thank you for the very kind words. And I, I can't even begin with that repeating that uh, trying to fill Dennis's, even one of his, one of his sandals is impossible. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling very small in that regard. Uh, this pro uh, program I'm giving tonight, fortunately, was pretty much together anyway. And I'm very happy to be able to uh, fill in and, and, and try and cover some ground. Um, it's particularly interesting, though, that, uh, I, and I wasn't aware of this, that you're having uh, Drew Lanham as your keynote speaker in September. His name's going to come up later in this presentation. And this presentation, it's a lot about birds, there's no question. But it really is about something, I think, more than birds. It's about people in place and how all that ties together. So um, it's, a, it's called 50-50-50. Uh, it's a passionate birding adventure, and it's based on the fact that, uh, and I'll go through the background on it some more, but it was the 50-50-50 comes from seeing 50 species on 50 individual days in each of the 50 states. Um, and if I can get the slides to advance, there we go. Uh, when I originally did this, of course, thank goodness, there was no COVID-19 and there was no pandemic and there were no restrictions and there was no fear and travel was maybe still expensive but it was easy and it couldn't have happened now uh, i predated it now we can't do it and we we miss those experiences and uh by the way elaine since you were the sharp eye before i see that the uh misspelling of experiences is still there i guess i forgot to save it uh after doing it um i'm hope i hope i have the right uh the presentation up, I'll, I'll know soon because I've added a slide and if it's not there, I'll get the other one up and go from there. Um, but birding for me, and I think for a lot of us, not for everyone, but for a lot of us, it's a very social activity and we miss that now. This is, we, we can't get out there and spend that time traveling to field trips, uh, seeing birds in the field with others, having more eyes and so oh, forth. Hello? Oh, I thought I was hearing someone else. Um, well, so, it, it, you know, I, I really miss that experience. And I, I think that this is a lot more about people in some respects than it is about the bird. I live in Edmonds uh, in Western Washington, like, like many of you, not everyone. Um, and Edmonds, Washington in particular, it's really a bubble. And it's culturally, it's politically, demographically, geographically, racially, and historically, very different from much of the rest of the United States, and even, frankly, from some parts of our own state. And 
we're living in a really tough time right now. There's so much divisiveness and contention. Um, people are looking at differences. They're not really looking at some of the things that bind us together and some of the things that have, I think, made our country so strong. And there's so much that's been us versus them. And this was back in uh, 2018. Yes, the second year of a certain president's term. And the conditions are already getting pretty, I think, pretty scary. And it was really saddening to me, and I was depressed, and, and it often angered me. So what am I going to do about that? I, I wanted to get out of that bubble, maybe, and try and get a better understanding of why it is that there were such differences in so many ways in this country. I could reject them, or I could try to understand them. I don't know if I could change them, but I wanted to at least get a better understanding. So you know, going out and getting that firsthand experience, um, was the way to do it, but it was through the birding community because that's something that I share with so many, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of us in this, in this United States and beyond. And we really do share that. And it's a, it's a, a foundation and potentially it's a bridge to have some other connections as well and maybe grow in that process. So um, I'm very passionate about birding. Uh, I'm, I'm a chaser. I'm a ticker or a lister or a twitcher, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I enjoy just, just being out in nature and particularly with others and with birds. Um, a passion is something that when it grabs hold of us, it's really a strong mo emotion. And sometimes we can't really control it even. It just pulls us and drives us. An adventure is something that uh, we can go out and get an experience through our activity. And, uh, you know, maybe have some fun. Maybe there's even a little fear sometimes. But we get out and we're, we're active. We're doing things. And my passion is for the combination of people and places and birds, especially together. And I often tell people that, you know, birding's a an opportunity for us to go out and we get to meet really neat people, see really neat places, and find really neat birds. And I don't recall a single time I've been out birding that I haven't had at least one of those three things, good people, good places, good birds. And on the really good days, of course, you get all of them. So feeling as I did in 2018 that I wanted to get out and, and, and see things outside of my bubble, I came up with this project, uh, an adventure, and I wanted to go to the 50 states. Um, I completed it. I did it. I succeeded uh, finally in November of 2019. And one of the themes that I try to do, come back to all the time in this program is to, it's not about me, it's about everyone. And we all should have things in our lives that are passions and that are adventures. And so, you know, where's yours going to take you? Is it birding? Is it one of these states? Is it a country? Find one of them and just use your passion as a catalyst to get out there and, 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 and do some, some things that are meaningful. So again, on 50 single days, one of those days in each of the 50 U.S. states, I wanted to find 50 species. Now, that's not necessarily a hard thing to do. Um, if I went through my Washington bird list, um, there's hundreds of days that I've seen more than 50 species. The thing that's tricky is that that is easier to do in May, for example, than it is in July. And if you're trying to fit that in for the 50 states, there's not 50 days in May to do that. Um, the other thing that was really important to me is that I wanted to do this in the company of local birders. That was the way not only to make it more efficient, but to find out, you know, different perspectives, meet different people, get some more locality and, and, and differences and, and, and get that connection. So off I went. So just some overview numbers. Um, on the trips, all of them. So some of them were just one or two days. Usually it was a day of travel, then birding, and another day of travel. But often it was part of a longer trip, or maybe a, a field trip uh, or a tour with a company. Maybe it was several days. And during those uh, specific project days, so the 50 project days, I saw a total of 3,528 species. So if you do the math, it's about 70 species on average on each of those project days. And of those different birds, 491 of them were actually different species. So in those 50 states, 
approximately on average, again, 10 per state. Now, of course, it didn't work that way. There were lots of states where there were seen, birds seen over and over and over from other times. And then there were other places that saw a lot of new birds. On the project trips, so that included extended stays in Texas and Arizona and Alaska and Florida and some other places, I had actually 660 different species. So that's not a bad life list uh, to, to do that. And I didn't set out to do it that way necessarily, although I did look at, uh, you know, tempting uh, targets in various places and did some organization by that. Um, when we do these projects, so people who do big years, for example, we have to admit that it's not very um, eco-centric or eco-friendly. There's a lot of travel that's involved. Um, I figured roughly during the time I did this, approximately 12,000 miles traveled by car and approximately 35,000 miles traveled by airplane. Now that doesn't compare even close to some of the big year trips where their numbers are many, many times that. Um, the thing that was really nice about it, or one of the things, was that during these actual project days, I had more than 300 people that I birded with. And some of those times were Audubon or Ornithological Society you know, field trips, and so maybe it was 30 or 40 people even for part of it. Certainly didn't get to know all of them, but I tried to intersect with as many as I could. Um, by the way, I, I should have mentioned this. I'm going to have a bird photo probably on each of the slides. And I've picked out ones, obviously, to me that are favorites or rare or something like that. Each of these species that I have and the pictures were taken during this, uh, this adventure of mine. So here's some more numbers. The biggest, the, mo the most birds that I saw on any one day was 101. And surprisingly, it was in New Hampshire. And we don't think of New Hampshire necessarily as uh, uh, a big birding state, but it, it has a little bit of coast, not much, but it has a little bit of coast, and it has lots and lots of lovely eastern forest. And this was also a day in May, so that helped. The fewest I saw in one day was 51. And since my goal was to see 50 and had to see 50 in each day, we just made it. Uh, as an aside, it was on some of those days that I remember praying to find a house sparrow or a, a starlings to just get one more number in there and go from there. It, it was never a goal to see the most birds I could in any one state. I wasn't trying to do big days. I was trying to have a, a fun experience. I was trying to meet with people and see those 50. What was interesting though is that as the thing went along, many of the people in the other states would say, well, so where are we today? How many have we seen? And they were as, as interested in getting to 50 as I was. And then it became a little more competitive. And so Iowa might say, well, how many did you just have in South Dakota? Because I want to beat them. And I said, well, I'm game for that. But that was not the goal. The way I, I generally did this was to try and bird uh, in, in areas where I could go to more than one state on one trip. Uh, there were many trips, though, in May. Uh, in fact, it was a 15-state marathon in 2019. It was a blast, uh, starting in Massachusetts, which is where my daughter lives, and then was able to bird New England and so forth, and ended up actually going into uh, the mid upper Midwest and then flew out to, uh, to Nevada. Um, I did some birding in every month except for July. And as I mentioned, I tried to, the, the map on the right shows sort of groupings, so those are color-coded by month. I tried to do states where maybe I could bird one day in the northeast part of one state, and then maybe the next day it would be the northwest part of another state or vice versa, uh, and then would travel from one state to the next. Uh, again, usually one day travel, one day birding. Uh, even though I birded with other people, well, everywhere I went with one exception, um, I tried to find 50 species on my own on that travel date, just to feel good about it. Uh, I did it most times, but not, not every time. And some of the trips were long and there really wasn't time to, to go ahead and uh, do the birding. Uh, I love logistics. Uh, I, I've done a number of sort of biggish years in Washington I've never done a big year on the ABA. 
And what I really enjoy, what, one of the things I really enjoy about that is doing the logistics. And the logistics is not just figuring out where to go, but when to get there, how to get from one place to another, and then also who to meet with. Um, I do a lot of the birding on my own in Washington, and then I do a lot of birding with others. And the thing with this state by state thing, because it was so important to meet with other people, uh, was setting up the logistics with them. Uh, as happens, sometimes someone would get sick or someone couldn't make it. So you had to have a plan B or a plan C. And it wasn't always convenient to be at a particular place on exactly the same day or time that someone else did. But that was actually part of the fun of it, too, because you ended up spending a lot of time talking to people, planning pe with people and getting to know them just as you set that up. Um, people have asked me often, well, so, you know, was this like a big year? And I said, well, not really for a number of reasons, including mostly the fact that it wasn't done in a single year. When I decided to do this in 2018 and came up with that project, I figured that if I was going to do it in one year, it would require being away from home uh, probably at least 100 days. And I just didn't want to do that. It was too much of a commitment. So I said, I'll go ahead and do as much as I could. I didn't start it, in fact, until uh, August of 2018. So it was get something done in 2018, see what you can do. But there were some states I had been to earlier. So there were states that were retroactive. So, for example, I had been on a wonderful trip with uh, John Pushchak to Alaska in 2015 uh, or 16, I can't remember, 2016. And I wanted to include that because that was obviously I wasn't going to drive there. So I figured I'll, I'll do those. Maybe I'll, I'll do them again or whatever. So it wasn't done in a single year. Interestingly, though, when I look backwards after the end, when it was all finished, every single state was done on a different day of the year. So it might have been uh, August 10th, but one of them was August 10th of 2018, and maybe August 11th was 2019. But there was no single date. It was just coincidence uh, where that worked out. Doing it in one year is definitely possible. And I sort of say to myself, well, maybe someday. It would take different planning and different logistics, and it would be a different experience, but it's definitely a possible thing to do. So. This is really the crux of it. I'm gonna talk about people and places and birds, of course. And most importantly to me were the people. And I don't know, let's see, I'm gonna move. I don't know what you see. If everyone sees just the screen, I'll move this over here. Um, so these are some of the people who are even more special, I guess. Um, Throughout the experience, one of the things I was trying to do was to build in as much diversity as I could. And that meant people uh, of different ages. It meant people who were you know, heavy duty birders, not as heavy duty birders. There were some famous birders and so forth. And I'll go through some of them now. So the gentleman in the top right uh, with the binoculars is a gentleman named Chan Robbins. And this was one of the reasons I wanted to include uh, retroactive uh, experiences. Chan Robbins, I'm, I'm sure many of you know who he is. He passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, amazing human being and just an incredible birder. Um, he started, among other things, the um, breeding bird surveys. Uh, he was the first person to get that started. And I met Chan very early on in my birding career, probably 1976 or 77. Uh, I'm from Maryland, uh, but I never did any birding there. I started birding when I moved to the West Coast and I was down in uh, the Bay Area. But uh, I was back in uh, Maryland and I attended a, a two-day conference on field trips with the Maryland, at that time it was called the Maryland Ornithological Union. Today it's MOS, the Maryland Ornithological Society. And Chan was the field trip leader. Uh, There's probably 25 of us that went out with him in the Pocomoke Swamp. And it was a wonderful day in May. And it was just an unbelievable experience, particularly for someone who was a, a, a new and at that time fairly young birder. We were walking through the swamp and he had, he's always paid lots of attention and has emphasized uh, bird song and hearing as part of the birding experience. 
And we would walk down this path and he would point over his left shoulder and say, there's a such and such. And then his right shoulder, there's a such and such, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, we had over 100 species that day. I didn't include that as the full list for this uh, project because I didn't keep as good notes back then as I do now. But Chan was also one of the authors of a field guide that maybe many of you have used. Uh, it, was, it was the Birds of America, Birds of North America in the Golden uh, Book Series. And I use, I still have two copies of that field guide and I actually still like it almost as much as anything else. Uh, going further right uh, in the right corner uh, was th this three birders in 2016. Uh, I met all of them. Uh, a fellow on the left is Christian Hagenlocher. Uh, the fellow in the middle is uh, John Weigel. And then the lady to the right is Laura Keene. And they all did big years in 2016. John, of course, then did another one last year. Uh, he was over 800 species both years. Laura, uh, at the time, was the uh, woman with the most uh, birds seen in the ABA. I can't remember what her number was. But she did a photographic big year and I think had something like 740 species that she had photographs of. Um, the two gentlemen lower uh, provided a very interesting experience. Uh, the fellow resting on a tombstone is uh, Olaf uh, Danielson, and the gentleman below him is uh, <laughs> a very funny story, and to me at least, is Neil Hayward. And I met both of them on that trip I mentioned with uh, John Kuschak up in Alaska. We were on a boat in uh, going out of ADAC, and uh, Neil at that time held the record as the for the big year in the ABA, and I think it was like 749 species. And Olaf was out to try and break his record, and Neil was acting as a assistant guide on the boat. So here was Neil helping Olaf find birds in Alaska. Uh, very interesting people. Uh, you may know that uh, Olaf also does hold a record for the most birds seen nude. I won't elaborate on that, but if you want to look at that story, um, there's, a, there's a book written about it. Okay, let's see if I can move this thing on. Uh, some more people. Uh, I'm going to skip the fellow in the top left in the middle there for a second and go, go to the right. And I'm with a fellow named Mike Resch, and Mike is a good friend, turned into good friend. Uh, I met Mike actually online. He called me he was coming out to uh, Washington because he also has a 50 state project, except his is far, far, far more ambitious. It's his goal to see 50 species, excuse me, 50% of the species in every one of the 50 states. Um, so if we have a good year in Washington and we add three or four birds, uh, he may need to come back out and find two more. And that's actually what happened. He had been uh, over 50% a number of years ago, but had fallen behind. So he wanted to come out, and he had heard about this wonderful place called Nia Bay. And he had seen my name on, I guess, some posts or whatever, and he contacted me, and we had a good conversation. He went out there, and lo and behold, what does he do? Not only add to his list, but he found, and I don't know if it was the first prothonotary warbler in Washington, but it was certainly one of the few. So uh, I birded with, my, with uh, Mike in several states. Uh, going down uh, on the lower left, uh, the fellow to the, the right in the blue jacket is a fellow named Floyd Murdoch. And Floyd was really, uh, he was a lot of fun. Uh, Floyd's a pretty famous guy himself. He was the fellow that in the year that Ken Kaufman did his big year and he wrote the Kingbird Highway, Floyd was the one that was in competition with him. And it was actually Floyd that saw more species that year. I think uh, Ken had 666 and uh, Floyd had 669. And Floyd got my name somehow from Ken Knittle, who passed away this year. And uh, he just called me and he said, hey, I'd like to join you. If you're gonna be down in Oklahoma, you wanna do that? And I said, sure. And uh, Floyd was extremely interesting. Uh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, very, very active in that, uh, that group. He's also definitely a Republican. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who he voted for in 2016, but I have a good guess, but I don't think he's gonna vote that way again. But we had lots and lots of good conversations, not just about the history of birding, including setting up the ABA, but also about very different perspectives on a very different part of the country. 
and some of that was uh, exactly what I was aiming for when I went out. Uh, the gentleman to the right, or my right at least as I'm looking at it, uh, is Victor Emmanuel. And I've been on several trips with uh, his, his uh, tour company and had the wonderful experience of being with Victor on my trip to Texas. That was the day that I had the, the 50, uh, 50 species day there. And uh, he just has wonderful, wonderful experiences and stories from all over the world. And I was honored. Uh, he wasn't, he had just come back from Peru and wasn't feeling real well that day, uh, the second day. And he, I actually got to drive his car. So uh, that was kind of a reversal in uh, re driving around with Victor. Uh, I'm going to go back up on top. And you may know many of you, uh, Brian Pendleton. Uh, Brian's uh, just a remarkable human being. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details on his, uh, his story, but I think many of you know uh, Brian has had for quite a few years now uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and uh, despite that has found a way to be incredibly active birder. He's an incredibly good birder. Has, he's, he no longer has the ability to use binoculars because he can't lift his arms, but he has incredible eyesight and uh, incredible hearing. Uh, birded with Brian many days. This is actually a picture of us at Mia Bay. And then I can't leave out in the lower uh, lower right corner. This is Cindy Bailey. Uh, Cindy, uh, I met Cindy in uh, March of 2019. Uh, she had never birded. Uh, we met online and uh, we are now living together and uh, moving in together and it's been wonderful. Uh, somehow she had enough courage and faith to come out and join me and one of her first birding experiences was at McGee Morris. That's not a bad way to start your career. But <clears throat> this experience was wonderful because in addition to those people who were in just amazing birders in, in sort of national uh, note, I, I, I birded people of all genders and uh, different orientations, different religions, different faiths, and definitely not. Uh, in addition to Brian with the ALS, I had heart attack survivors, uh, people with diabetes, brain surgery survivors, someone who had MS and for whom birding was a very important part of his life. A lot of people were into photography, a lot weren't. Um, the people that I've picked out to show here, Dave Lambeth is up at Kelly Slough in North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota is one of the three states I had not been to before I started this project, like been to at all. Uh, Dave's about 80 and just incredible birder, wonderful human being, solid Midwesterner, and we had uh, not just great birding, but lots of lots of good times to talk about. Uh, the lady on the right is someone that I just met through an Audubon uh, club. That's how I met a lot of people, is just contacting local Audubon clubs or ornithological societies and say, hey, here's what I'm doing, can you, get me in touch with someone. So Beth Poole was in West Virginia, and uh, we, we had, again, a lot of fun. I think Beth had maybe probably more fun than I did, and she was very, very proud of the birds we found, including a spectacular prothonotary warbler that was one of my favorite birds of the trip. You probably know at least one of the two guys in the uh, Nebraska picture. Uh, on the right is Michael Willison. Uh, he now lives in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we had a great two days birding together. And that's Newt Hansen uh, to the left. And Newt has spent a lot of time birding here as well. And then down in the in the right uh, is a fellow that I met that uh, was the last day of my birding. It was in Arkansas. It was the last day they got the 50. His name is uh, Vivek Kumar. And Vivek is one of these just great stories. Uh, he's uh, from Dubai, uh, got to Canada, got his uh, degree in Canada. Uh, and now he's at the University of Arkansas doing uh, PhD work and he's in biochemistry. He tried on several occasions to explain what it was that he works on and I couldn't understand any of it. But he came into that community and, you know, Arkansas is, it's, as a state is not the most diverse community, but the University of Arkansas, many of our universities, towns really are. And he came in and he's just a phenomenal birder and he is already, after being there just a couple of years, uh, a major part of that birding community. He was very gracious in giving his time. Again, a very, very wonderful birder. Where actually this picture was taken outside of a uh, McDonald's. It was the, we had finished the day, we had had good birds, and uh, we had not seen a house sparrow. And he said, well, I know where some roost at night. 
And so we went to this uh, McDonald's, and in fact, there they were in a tree right outside the the the, 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 the restaurant. But I, I tried to get people of all colors and all you know, backgrounds and nationalities and ethnicities and so forth. But it wasn't all that easy to do. And that's going to lead me to something that I uh, I mentioned that um, you you talked about Drew Lanham is going to be your your speaker in September. And the last couple months of actually back in, in uh, starting, I guess it was May, uh, maybe a little earlier, things were really sparked by that episode in Central Park, New York. And there was a, a, a African-American birder, uh, Christian Cooper, was out birding and uh, a woman, Amy Cooper, was there with her, her dog in a place where you're not supposed to have a dog. And uh, he asked her politely to you know, not do that. And it ends up being this uh, big uh, confrontation and an unpleasant situation. And there were a lot of consequences from that. And in part, that engendered an awareness of just how underrepresented many, but it, particularly uh, Black Americans, are in our birding communities and our birding lives. And there was a uh, reaction to that. Audubon got behind a Black Birders Week in June. Uh, Drew Lanham has been very, very much uh, a proponent of getting diversity in birding. And his Home Place book that uh, was mentioned is a wonderful book. Uh, Jason Ward, who's a protege of uh, Drew Lanham, uh, does a lot of birding in New York, uh, in Central Park himself. And he's been able to put together a, a TV program called Birds of North America as a TV series. And, you know, we all need to do something to diversify our own lives and intersect with, with more and more people, get different perspectives and bring our perspectives and share them with them. One of the things I've, I've always sort of come to in that regard is, you know, if a bird sees us, what do they see? Do they see you as black or white, as Jewish or Catholic, as atheist or believer? Do they see you as old or young? Do they see you as Democrat or Republican? And the answer is, well, birds don't see any of that. But I don't think it would matter. Uh, we're birders. And when we see birds, we separate them by color and we separate them by species and so forth. But we see them all, whatever those colors are, we see them as wonderful birds. And isn't that the way we ought to see each other as well? And so I've added this thing at the end there. It's, you know, what's WASP doing about that? And, and it sounds like there are some things going on. Um, but I think there's more we all can do. And I'm, I'm working on a couple of things that I hope will, you know, maybe broaden my horizons and perspectives as well. But I certainly would encourage everyone to do that. I went to some incredible places during this trip. Um, I used it as a way to uh, go to places maybe I'd heard about but never had done. I say, well, I'm in your state. I'm there. Let's just take a look. Uh, I'd never been to Las Vegas before. So I arranged to go into Las Vegas and uh, met some wonderful birders there. We went out. Uh, I didn't go into the casinos, but I, I did drive through the Miracle Mile or whatever it's called. Quite a place that's uh, not, not some place I'd like to live. But the birding outside of it was really quite wonderful. I uh, had the opportunity to take the ferry between Cape May, uh, New Jersey, and Lewis, uh, Delaware. Uh, good birding uh, both sides of the ferry. The ferry trip itself wasn't so so great. But uh, just sort of one of those things you sort of tick off on your, uh, your birding list, the things you'd like to, to do. Um, when I was in Indiana, I had a chance to go to the Indianapolis Speedway. It was unfortunate. There, there was no race that day. Uh, and in fact, the race was closed. The, the track was closed. You couldn't actually get down on the track. They have a wonderful museum there. I was able to be in the grandstands and look out at it. Just another one of those places that's iconic and that you, uh, you know, you've heard about. Um, in the middle of the Yellow Rails and Rice Festival, I would recommend that to everybody. Uh, had a chance to meet a lot of very, very different, interesting people there. Uh, rice farmers got a chance to ride in the combine. Uh, did see some yellow rails. Very, very different part of the world, very, very different part of the country. It's, it's even very different from New Orleans or New Orleans, as you might say. Uh, lower right is the uh, arch at St. Louis. Um, it's about as Midwest as you can get. 
had great birding in and around St. Louis and then just across the river in Illinois. But it was, again, one of those iconic places. I, had, I just had never been there, and I thought, well, I want to see what that looks like on that great river. Uh, Rock Reef Pass is in the uh, Everglades, and it actually is. That's the elevation. It's three feet, and it's a pass. That's the high point for miles and miles after that. And the thing that I think that brings home as much as anything else is as we go into the climate change and the global warming and all the things that are going to happen, uh, you know, one of the biggest things is we're going to lose a lot of coastline. There are a lot of places in this country that are at or below sea level or not much above it, and they're not going to be there in not too many years. And there's many, many consequences that come from that. Being in the Everglades and having that perspective while I was there was, uh, was very, very meaningful. I did have a chance uh, to visit the, uh, one of the battleships. And uh, that was, again, a very, very different experience. I'm skipping the uh, beautiful little uh, hacienda or B&B uh, &B on the middle right. That's uh, Casa San Pedro, the San Pedro in Arizona. Highly recommend it to everyone who wants to go. Okay, how about some birds? Um, these are some favorite birds in favorite places. Uh, again, there were, you know, 660 species, so there were a lot to, to pull from. These were some of my favorites. Um, being in Alaska in Nome, I don't know how many of you have been there. Uh, if you have a chance to go, go. If you have a chance to go with John Pushchot, do that too. Nome is just a wonderful, incredible place with uh, breeding birds. I was there in June, early June of uh, uh, 2016. Uh, so the, these are two lifers, spectacled eider and arctic warbler. Uh, it's a very doable place even on your own if you can get a car and a place to stay. And that's not so easy because there aren't that many of them around. Uh, redneck stint, then seeing a long-tailed, many long-tailed Jaegers and breeding plumage right there on the ground and breeding, fantastic. Um, and then also Eastern Yellow Wagtail and Aleutian Tern. Uh, again, just, just wonderful, wonderful birds. Uh, there's three main roads in Nome. Uh, you just drive out each one of them. There's birding all over the place and it's, uh, a great experience. Uh, I'm sure many people here have been down to Arizona. I know that uh, I think Jim was on the, the list and uh, Jim leads groups down there. Um, while I was down there, went had a chance to go to, a, it was a trip with, uh, with Wings, and so it was uh, part of a, a field trip, or excuse me, a tour. Uh, we went to all the hot spots, you know, Huachuca's, we went to Madeira, we went to Mount Lemon, Carr Canyon, Ash Canyon, Hunter Canyon, Cave Creek Canyon, Canyon and so forth. One of the things I was trying to do, I'd birded Arizona before, but many, many years ago before I took photos, uh, before I even had a camera. So I was trying to catch up on a lot of pictures of uh, species I'd seen and then have a chance to add some, um, some photos to that. So there's a list of birds that are here. I'll show you some pictures of some of them. Um, we had a couple quite, quite rare ones, uh, Rufus Cap Warbler, uh, Tufted uh, flycatcher. Uh, we had the uh, Mexican whippoorwill and the elegant trogon. Uh, we 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 had the Montezuma's quail. So just wonderful Arizona birding. And this was in August. And August is one of the best times to be in Arizona. It's called their second spring. The weather's better when you're up in the mountains. Particularly, it's not very hot. It's a wonderful time. So this is the rufous cap warbler that uh, we hiked up to see in Hunter Canyon. Uh, we did see several trogons in the Huachucas. Um, it's pretty hard not to fall in love with a vermilion flycatcher. Uh, saw them in uh, several locations, including at that Casa de San Pedro. There was a nesting pair right out the window, uh, Mexican jay and Madeira, and buff-breasted flycatcher in Car Canyon. There was also a uh, tufted flycatcher there. It was kind of a tough day. Uh, it had been seen regularly for several days. We got there a little bit later than we had wanted to. People were leaving and said, yeah, they had seen it. So we went looking for it and spread out and we found it for like five seconds and then it flew off. We couldn't relocate it. We split up and I went off with uh, one other person, one direction and didn't happen often, but this time I was the person who actually found it again. I took a real quick picture with my uh, camera at the time, and I had to make a decision. Do I stay or do I go back and get the rest of the group? 
So I made the decision to get the rest of the group. Now that was the only picture of it I got. We did find it again, it took us an hour, but uh, good bird. And then I, I just, I love the Pyroloxia. There's, uh, you know, that little cardinal look to it. It's, it's one of my favorite birds. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, my, my girlfriend, my partner, Cindy, did have a chance to come out, and she flew out and made, met her in Detroit. We went to McGee Marsh. Uh, many of the birders that I had met elsewhere were at McGee Marsh while I was there. It wasn't during the biggest week in uh, American birding. It was the week after, but there's still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. Uh, highly recommended as a place to go. It was my first time to be there. And I have to say that the highlight uh, among many highlights was actually getting a photo of a Connecticut warbler. It was my 700 uh, ABA species that I had a photo of. One of the 24 species that were seen uh, there in, uh, among the 77 that were seen on May 15th. Uh, it was my life picture of a Blackburnian warbler. Uh, there's the Connecticut warbler, which was just pure luck. I was leaving, actually leaving for the day and had gotten out of the parking area and there's this big line of people over by one of the marshy spots so i figured what the heck i'll leave the car where it is i'll go see what it was i got there and i said well what is it and they said it's a connecticut warbler it's a connecticut warbler and just as they said that it popped up right in front of my feet no more than six feet away from me so uh, thank you doesn't always work that way as we all know um, canada warbler chestnut sided warbler Sure wish I could find a chestnut sided warbler in Washington. I've chased four of them and have been a day late on all of them. But uh, warblers there are just incredible. Magnolia warbler and bay breasted. So another really wonderful visit was in Florida. Uh, had a chance to go down there. We met up with uh, a guide. And when I say we, it was uh, another birder from Edmonds area. Uh, we went down, we met up with a, a guide, Paul Bithorn, who's a, just a real character, fascinating guy. And uh, we, we spent, I think we were there five, maybe six days, including a trip down uh, to the Dry Tortugas. Lots and lots of uh, life photos, a couple life birds. Yeah, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, one place that was incredible is a place called Cramden Park. And in Cramden Park, we had thick billed vireo, black, black whiskered vireo, banana quit, and western spindalis. And we missed Bahama mockingbird, and there was, uh, I can't remember the other one, missed one other bird that was a rare, oh, a uh, uh, fork-tailed uh, flycatch, incredible. So a uh, couple birds from Florida, gray kingbird and gray-headed swamp hen. Uh, there were 62 species on that day, but well over 140 for the whole trip. Spot-breasted oriole, black-whiskered vireo. Uh, the banana quit, uh, which is again one of the birds I found, which was just pure luck. Uh, just happened to come around the corner and found it and was able to go back and get everyone else. And then this is probably my all-time favorite experience and photo in, in, in many respects. We were down at the Everglades. We had seen a couple of swallow-tailed kites in the distance. And then two came down and literally flew all around us, sometimes within 10 feet for about five minutes. I couldn't get my camera to focus. They were so close at times, but I did end up getting a lot of good pictures and uh, this still ranks them maybe, maybe as my all time favorite. Um, another of the hotspots that anyone goes to if you're trying to do a big year, but it's just great for birding and I certainly had to include it. Uh, it was the trip with uh, Victor Emanuel, and where I met Victor. We went to all the great places, you know, Rancis and King Ranch, Estera Llano, Llano uh, South Padre, Santa Ana, and so forth, and then down along the Rio Grande. Um, I don't know what it's like down there now with all this craziness with the border and so forth. Uh, this was in 2017, and uh, we had just wonderful birding, and then I left the group and went up to get the uh, uh, black-capped uh, vireo and the uh, golden cheek warbler later. But uh, the main thing for me, uh, I had been in Texas several times and I'd never seen a whooping crane. I had been there the day after the last one left once and then just completely wrong times of the year at other times. So the whooping crane was the one day I, I wanted to do the 50 species. It turns out we had 81 species that day, including the whooping crane. 
clay-colored thrush used to be a very, very rare bird, and now they're, they're seen pretty regularly. There's other birds, of course, that are not seen as regularly, including uh, the Jacana or the Hasana, which I remembered seeing in the 70s when I was down there, and also with the brown jay. Um, don't know if you've seen the reddish egrets doing their crazy dances, but they are fun to watch and was able to catch a photo. And uh, they're, they're just, they're, they're wonderful birds. They're just so active as they're racing around in their, their various poses. Uh, great Kiskadi, black crested titmouse, and of course a buff bellied hummingbird. Utah was a place I'd never, I'd been through Utah once, I'd never birded there. Um, and I was able to go and uh, get there earlier in the, uh, in the, early enough in the day to go to several spots. Uh, so the day before my actual big day, if you want to call it that, uh, I think I got something like 60 species on my own. But the main, my main goal there was to get a picture, finally, 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 of a flammulated owl. The flammulated owl and the boreal owl are my two nemesis birds in Washington for having heard them many times but never haven't got a picture still don't have a picture of either one but uh tim avery and uh in utah uh, he knows that this, that's his deal is uh flam flammulated owls great birder period but uh i signed on with him and we went out that evening and uh, was able to get get this picture of the, the flammulated owl uh, other good birds there too uh, a couple of favorites white faced ibis and columbia spurio Hawaii, as I told you, was the really tough, tough uh, day. Um, there's not a lot of birds in Hawaii, period. Uh, most of them are introduced. Uh, there are you know, some tough to find native birds and so forth, but it's hard to do a big day in Hawaii, uh, particularly if you're limited to you know, one island. So what I did is I, I hooked up with the guide, Lance Tonino, and, or Tonino, excuse me, and uh, we arranged the, the 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 day, and he was pretty sure we'd get get 50 species. Um, I had been to a spot the day before on my own, and had picked up uh, a, quite a few birds. I think something like 18 or 20, uh, and some of those were ones we actually did not see on this day. But uh, we were able to get 51 species, and uh, boy, I tell you that last species was uh, very celebrated. One of the interesting things about this trip was uh, on all of the trips, all the days, I only had weather issues on two of them. One was a fairly heavy rain in Virginia, and then there was another day where it rained in, in New York, but I was still able to, to find the birds. I would have done much better had it not been for that. But the thing that was interesting in Hawaii, we, it was a crystal clear day the whole day. Hilo gets more rain than any other place in the United States not a single drop of rain, beautiful cloudless day when we were there. So that was really nice. Um, a really fun and surprising uh, thing to me was a visiting uh, New Mexico. I went uh, down there in January and did, uh, went to, among other places, Bosque del Apache, which is just a wonderful, wonderful refuge and lots and lots of birds. But uh, I was able to combine that with then the next day, not, not part of the, the, the 50 species day, going up into the mountains and, and finally getting some really good pictures of uh, the uh, rosy finches, the black rosy finch. All, all three species were there. I had seen them before in Colorado, but had only seen two black rosy finches, and there were more than 50 uh, in, in New Mexico. And New Mexico is an incredibly, I, I'd love to get back to all the places I visited, but I'd really like to get back and see New Mexico and, 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 and do the birding there. Uh, as I mentioned, the last day uh, of my trip was November 9th in uh, last year, 70 species with Vivek uh, in uh, Arkansas, and uh, he worked and worked and worked and worked to get me a picture of a little con sparrow. We ended up seeing several of them. Uh, it may be my, my, if the black-throated sparrow isn't my favorite, I guess Lacan's probably is, maybe Lincoln's is third. Lots of sedge wrens as well. Uh, North Dakota was with uh, David Lambeth, as I mentioned, and the bird on the left was one that just just took our breath away. We we're driving down the road pretty fast. We saw this white hawk sitting on a, a power line, and we did a U-turn, came back. It's the first really, you know, criders, pure criders, white, 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 red-tailed hawk I'd ever seen. 
you know, it was actually one of the first ones David had seen too, and he's been birding there for uh, decades. Um, one of my favorite birds was seen in a number of states was the red-headed woodpecker, and uh, that ranged from fairly far into the southeast, all through the Midwest, and up into the prairie states. Uh, just a gorgeous bird. So I've told you some of the stories. I'll, I'll go over a couple of them real quickly again. Uh, the Yellow Rails and Rice Festival was a disaster in this sense. I got out to see the, uh, you go to a rice field, there's a, a farmers harvesting rice in the combine, and there are a number of rails there, including yellow rails, and they are sort of uh, spooked out by the combine. They fly out and it gives you a chance to see them. Sometimes you get to see them when they land and so forth. So I get down there and I get out my camera and I start to try and get it set up for the right settings and it went dead, completely dead. So I was not able to get a single photo uh, while I was there. And uh, that was a major, major disappointment. But I had wonderful visits with lots of farmers. Some of them were bird conservation oriented, many of them were not. All of them were Republicans, all of them were quite religious, all of them were very, very different from me. But uh, we were able to really, uh, I think, have some pretty good conversations and at least understand where each of us were coming from. Paul Royson was a fellow who I contacted. He uh, lives in Iowa, but he just jumped on this project. He said, how can I help you? And he ended up setting, he birded with me in two states, South Dakota and Iowa. And he uh, uh, set me up with someone uh, in, in well, actually with, with Dave Lambeth in North Dakota. He, um, very, very religious guy, uh, very, very, uh, again, very missing Western been on many uh, missionary trips throughout Africa, has wonderful, wonderful stories. We don't believe in a lot of the same things, and we do believe in a lot of other same things. But again, just it was great to have birding as the safe ground that allowed us to talk about a number of different things. Uh, Jamaica Bay in uh, New York was maybe one of my, maybe the second favorite experience on this trip. Um, I had birded at Prospect Park in Brooklyn, uh, didn't have quite enough species because it had been raining. Went over to Jamaica Bay because I'd never been there, wanted to bird there anywhere. Anyway, birded by myself, wasn't with anyone else. I'd been with several people in, in Prospect Park. And at the end of the day, as I'm coming back into the parking lot, there's a young couple that's walking down the pathway, not birders, coming towards me. And they had a little girl who was walking with them who was maybe three years old. For whatever reason, I have no idea, she saw me with my camera and my binoculars, and she just started running towards me. And she just jumped up into my arms. And I felt like, oh my gosh, what do these parents think? What's going on here? And I, I looked at them, and they had this quizzical look on their face. And they came up to me, and they said they'd never seen her do that. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. They said, no, no, don't be sorry at all. Look at the smile on her face. And she somehow had put together that I was looking at birds. And she was talking. She didn't have a gigantic vocabulary, but she was talking about ducks and she was talking about birds. And um, we had just this incredibly wonderful experience. Who knows? Maybe she'll remember that and someday she'll become a birder. But it was just such a powerful feeling of being there. There was no one else around us. And to me, that's kind of what it's all about. Uh, I'm gonna skip the Louisville Cemetery for a moment. I mentioned Mike Resch to you with his 50% of all the birds in all the states. And I, just a reminder that all of us can have projects and just find something that you know, tugs at you and just let it, let it take you places. Pat Luters is a uh, guide that uh, works for Naturalist Journeys. I somehow got Pat's name. She lives in St. Louis. She was very gracious and went out with me both uh, in St. Louis and then across the river in Illinois. Um, the story that I like most about Pat, though, is reminding me again of how different things are in the Northwest and how lucky we are. Um, St. Louis had a lot of old money. St. Louis had a lot of uh, industry. Uh, it's it's coming back now, but it's had some issues going going away, and there's some depressed parts of the town. But Pat had and her husband had had a very uh, high-end restaurant for a number of years. They did quite well, and originally lived in, or at one point lived in a very very nice neighborhood. As we were driving around after the birding, she showed me some neighborhoods, and 
uh, we went to this one that had these just giant houses, I mean, 4,000 square feet on, I don't know, a uh, couple acres of land or something like that, maybe an acre, I, I can't judge. And so I asked her, I said, you know, Pat, I'm curious, you know, what would a house like this cost here? She kind of apologized and said, well, you know, these are, these are pretty expensive. This is the nice part of town. And I said, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, we'll see that one. That's probably, oh, at least seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. And not saying that's not a lot of money, but the housing situation that we live in in Seattle $700,000 barely gets you started anymore. And it's just a totally different economic world out there. And that has a lot of difference in how people see things with opportunity and, and so forth. I told you the story of Floyd Murdoch. Uh, McGee Marsh was just phenomenal. One of the things that was so much fun at McGee Marsh was uh, seeing all the, uh, the Amish birders that were there. And it was an experience I'd never had before. And there's varying degrees of how removed from technology they are, but mostly they're pretty removed from technology, including sometimes not even be able to drive a car or have a cell phone or whatever. But uh, a, a lot of them, it's a very active birding community. And there were dozens and dozens of Amish folks uh, at the marsh. I only got to talk to a couple of them, uh, but it was mostly about birds. Uh, I mentioned Tawas, T-A-W-A-S, which is in Michigan. And uh, it's another really great birding spot. I went to a, the Tawas Birding Festival on the lake. Uh, earlier had gone up and saw the Kirtland's Warbler uh, up in Neo and, um, as a, a life bird. Uh, I mentioned the weather just being blessed, having really good weather. The Louisville Cemetery was probably my favorite story. Um, I had never been to Kentucky, so that was cool just to be there at all. Uh, I met, went out with uh, a couple of really cool people that I'd met. One was uh, at a, a bookstore that she was closing down, but I uh, was able to go out with her and uh, went out with uh, the old, one of the oldest birding clubs in the country uh, in Louisville, and they were having a field trip at the Louisville Cemetery. And we were led, there was a uh, African-American guy who was with the cemetery, he was uh, bar just just barely into birding, but he was getting to know his birds and knew the cemetery and took us around. And we went to this one spot, and there were three graves there that were just of note, and they were right literally right across from each other. One of them was was one of the Jim Beam whiskey families, and I had been to the Jim Beam brewery or distillery, excuse me, the day before. That was one of the things I figured I wanted to do when I was in Kentucky. I couldn't go to the Kentucky Derby. Uh, so I had a chance to do that, but then a, right, right next to, or maybe it was two grave sites down from that, was the uh, grave of uh, Harlan Sanders, uh, Kentucky of uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, that's a pretty Kentucky experience, I figured. But by far and away, the most important thing was literally right across from the grave of Harlan Sanders. And I see my batteries running low, so I'm gonna go plug in and change my seating a little bit. Um, was the grave? Oh, shoot. I'm going to have to uh, close this down and start it back up again. It'll take one minute. I apologize. Eric? I'll be back in a second. I'm sorry. Eric Dudley? Eric? Yes? thought we'd just entertain the crew here by asking our wonderful president and, of course, okay. your backup, Mary Kay, how you're doing. So let's see if I can <laughs> get back here. <laughs> oh. Am I still? Am I still being heard? Yes, we hear you, Blair. All right, I need to hang on just one second. Apologize. My That's computer all. has this one little glitch. 
in that if you pick it up, it tends to uh, turn itself off, and that's what just happened. So hopefully this will get us back there. You may have to reconnect me, Elaine. I apologize. No worries. No worries. It's the joy of being okay. an all-volunteer organization. <laughs> I have Let's a message. Let's see what happens. Oh, there you go. All right. All right. So... So let's, so let's see. see. <laughs> Ooh, this is not this is terrible feedback. We can hear you wherever you're holding your phone. It's okay. Good. Okay. So, I'm going to have to just go through this way. So I don't know why we're. The computer's volume maybe went up. What is that what happened? Maybe, maybe. Was it going through the volume? We love you in duplicate Blair. Yeah. So I'm going to mute my phone and see if. The speak. No. Elaine, what if you were to turn off the volume on your computer or something? Turn off your mic. That fixed it. That's better. I just muted Blair's computer. Oh, shoot. Okay. That's what I did. You're okay, Blair. Go ahead. He muted his phone. I unmuted my phone. Okay, that's better, Blair. Okay. All right. Well, we just finished the, the story. So what I normally do if I was showing this live, um, I'd say let's take a break now. And the, again, the, one of the whole things about this is to use your passion for birding to live your life and have stories in it. And so maybe I'll, what I'd just say is take a break, but don't go away. Just think of, a, of, a, of your own favorite story, one that you've had in the past, and, and recall that feeling. Hopefully it was one that you shared with someone. And then later, after we're done and sometime later, pick up your phone and call somebody, or pick up your computer and write someone, or use your phone for it and share your stories, because that's really what we're doing. We're connecting with each other through birds. And I think that's one of the, the there's just very little that's better than that. So these, these are the lessons that I learned. I had a great time, certainly, first of all, saw a lot of different places. But the lessons that I learned was really to celebrate and appreciate diversity. There were so many things that people told me and shared with me that, I just didn't really know firsthand. I knew of it, heard about it maybe, talked about it, but to be able to really share it directly with other people and, and who had very, very di different life stories and backgrounds was wonderful. Um, our birding community locally and across the country and across the world, it's just incredibly rich and it's incredibly kind. There's very, very few people who wouldn't do almost anything for you if you gave them a chance to. Um, we don't need to limit this to birding, obviously, but, but pay it forward. There are people out there who visit our area. Go out with them. Share your stories with them. Get their stories from them. And uh, just return the favors that all of us get in our lives. Uh, don't ever be afraid to ask for help. I was just amazed at how helpful people were. They wanted to take over the day, and, and they were just as again, as committed to it as I was, and more so in many cases. Um, and, and to do that, you have to reach out a little bit. You have to get outside of yourself a bit, but do that. Reach out to others. 
you know, bring your life to them and, and let them bring their life to you. The reward is in the participation itself. It's not really, and it, it's taken me a while to do this, and I finally have as I do my chases because they're not always successful. But just doing it feels so good. The, the participation in something you enjoy is all you need. It, it, it's fine. Um, Mike Resch, the fellow that I mentioned many times, has a saying. He says, you've got to speculate to accumulate. You're not always going to get that identification right. So what? Who cares? It's the attempt to try and do so, and it's getting better in the process. It's learning about it that, that's really important. Um, it was very clear to me as I saw different contexts, different economies, different uh, communities. There are real reasons for some of the different opinions that we have. We, we live in our bubble. They live in their bubbles, or their bubbles are maybe smaller or bigger. doesn't matter. But the context of where you are, where you've been, and what you're doing, it matters a lot. And to be able to put yourself into someone else's shoes, into someone else's context, and often being able to slide into that by the birding is, is just very, very critical to bringing us together. Um, one of the things that I've learned uh, directly and indirectly is no matter what you do, if you're doing that participation, there's almost always a consolation prize. No, you don't get to see the such and such, but you do get to see something else. And if you're just out there doing, if you're out there active, those rewards are just, they're always available. So what's next? Um, well, I, I want to continue to do programs like this. I keep modifying it. Probably could get several good ideas from you of how to change this and make it better. Um, I really want to get back to these states with some of the people. It was so disappointing not to be able to do the travel this year I had planned because of the pandemic. Uh, I want to get to different parts of the states and, and see some of the, the grasslands and see some of the swamps and so forth with some of the people that I've met. Um, I've been wanting to put a book together sharing the experiences. I've written most of them up in some respects uh, on my blog post. But uh, this year with the COVID-19, it's just really hampered a lot of the energy for doing some of these things. Uh, maybe it'll still happen. Um, I'd like to continue to encourage others uh, to explore diversity and build the diversity within our own, their own and our own birding communities. Um, it's not an easy thing to do because we don't normally intersect with people who are unlike ourselves. So we have to make an active plan to do that. And organizations like Audubon, organizations like uh, WASP can be so, so important in doing that. I'm very glad to see that your program on September is going in, in that direction. And it sounds like CINI, the, the, the uh, article that you've written should be just wonderful in, in that regard. Um, I'd, I'd like to see others undertake their own 50-50 challenges or some adventures like that. It'd be fun to see, I, I think, have a national day where, in fact, in this time when, you know, we're so diverse and apart and fighting each other, um, maybe birding, one day we could say, let's everyone have birding today in all 50 states. We'll report our adventures together and, and bring us together that way. Um, I want to continue meeting with people that I've, I've met with before and make new friends. And I've got a couple things that I've got going that are just maybe getting started with the ABA. Um, I've talked a lot. I'm getting hoarse, in fact, and I apologize. Probably said way too much and probably more, more, more quantity. 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 Um, but I think, you know, it's, you know, about, it's about having a passion. And I'm getting feedback, I'm getting feedback again, again now. Again now. Let that passion take you on adventure. Be active. Embrace that diversity. Grow from that. Try new things and acknowledge how fortunate we are to have each other, to have birding as part of our lives, and to have it take us to so many great places with great people. Um, you know, have fun, but be fun too. Add to the group, add to the experience. Live your life to get some stories and share them with others. And then particularly in times like this, stay safe. Uh, it's a very scary time. It's a scary time in many ways, but particularly scary for our own personal health. Um, I've been out birding some this year, not nearly as much as, as usual, uh, but I'm, I wear masks or I keep my distance or I don't bird with others. And I miss that. 
but uh, we have to be around and do it again some other time. So again, thank you everybody. Uh, I hope you've gotten at least something out of it, enjoyed maybe some of the photos. Be happy to either after this or uh, following up later, you know, share any of experiences or uh, give you names and people contacts. Or whatever. Thank you much. All right, thank you so much, Blair. That was a lot of juggling of devices. So um, I appreciate, I so appreciate your willingness to work with that. And it, you know, for the most part, it was you were loud and clear. So thank you so much for your message. Um, I think people are going to put in some questions here, so we'll read them back to you. Um, while um, while people are thinking about their questions, to to Join Joss if they haven't joined already. I guess I'm getting a lot of people too. Okay, I think my computer is now working, so I'm going to turn this off. Okay, how's that? Okay, no more feedback. Wow, that's great. Just in time, Blair. Blair started, with but we can't hear Blair. We can't hear Blair. Well, he can maybe turn it back on when he answers a question. There is one uh, question, if I may. Carol Langford is asking to you to tell us about your blog, Blair. Oh, yes. Okay, uh, I'm getting feedback, but I'll, I'll struggle through it. Is it, let's see, um, how's that, is that better? It's doable. Okay, so um, I, I do write a blog. Uh, it's called, uh, you can access it through uh, blairbirding.com, I believe. And the reason I say that is um, I've posted uh, sometimes references to the blog on tweeters, and some people are able to open it and some not. Um, I've had, I think, maybe 250 or something like that blog posts. They're obviously not all about this trip, although I tried to do one after I returned from, from most of the trips. And so it might've been several days or it might've been, uh, I mean, several states or it might've been just one state. A lot of pictures and uh, some, some reflections. And I, I tried to avoid doing, and then I did this, and then I did that, and then I did this, and then I did that. But inevitably there's a lot of that that's there. Um, so anyway, Bert, Blair, Blair Birding, uh, all lowercase.com uh, should get you to that. I really appreciated your masked uh, blog post, Blair. That was really great. <laughs> all birds, all birds. Very relevant. Yeah, well, well. Someone has asked, we, we who was the to, third person in the cemetery? Who was the third person in the cemetery? Okay, well, there were three, there were three graves. So one of them was one of the Jim Beam whiskey family. One was Colonel Sanders. And one was, uh, oh, I, I, I forgot to mention the name. That's right. My gosh, you're right. The most important part of that story. So the other grave was Muhammad Ali. And he was known as the Louisville Lip. And I can't believe I forgot to say that. So sorry. He, um, he was a childhood hero. I mean, he was bigger than life, amazing human being. You know, he ended up with Parkinson's disease and uh, it, it really limited him in some respects, but he came out very early on for all of the things that are being fought for today in terms of not just, you know, uh, African-American and, and racial equality, but human equality. And uh, just, uh, I trembled when I was at that gravesite. It was just so powerful, you know, to be there. It's very simple, but very, very powerful. And to you know, have that with there was a great horned owl that was overhead. It was pretty spectacular. Are we still live? Okay. Any other questions, anyone? Thanks very much. If not, uh, Cindy, back to you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, Blair. I, you're that was just super inspirational. I love the idea of um breaking down barriers and connecting with people and how you did that all around the country is, um, it's really inspiring. Um, we really do need to reach out and get outside of ourselves. So thanks. And 
it, thank you so much it's for there it's there for everyone to do just have to do it yeah it's a great message great message i hope that they will return when another small child will run up and jump into all of our arms pretty pretty magical it really is but maybe that's what birds do for us who knows well i really do think about birds as kind of this common link uh when i'm with people that are you know with family members that i don't agree with everything on we birds is that common link and we can connect on birds they're beautiful they're accessible everyone can see them so it's what brings us all together here, here. Um, 